Mr. Hodge. Commissioner, I have some very brief closing observations. Well, you announced at the uh, uh, beginning of this round that uh, it was proposed to uh, deal with closing submissions somewhat differently this time. Yes. Yes. So the way that we propose to deal with it is that by Friday of next week, council assisting will provide written submissions to you, which will constitute the full closing submissions from council assisting. And that will include the specific findings that council assisting says may be open to you, commissioner, with respect to the evidence that you've heard in respect of particular entities. And we'll also, in some detail, address or outline the particular policy issues for consideration both by parties granted leave to appear and also for other members of the public who wish to make public submissions. I think I'm in your hands, Commissioner, but I think you are the one who are going to tell us about <laughs> what process you would like to use for the receipt of submissions. I don't well, want to presuppose anything. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Council assisting will make written closing submissions uh, which are to be published on the Commission's website uh, by 5pm next Friday, 24 August uh, 2018. Those submissions will uh, include submissions about uh, the particular case studies that have been undertaken those submissions will also include uh, the identification of what council assisting see as uh, issues or questions of principle that arise. So far, so good, Mr Hodge? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Um, what is then proposed is that parties having leave to appear would have until 5pm on Friday 31 August, so a further seven days, to file written submissions uh, not exceeding 20 pages uh, in relation to each case study. In, and those written submissions not exceeding 20 pages per case study would relate to the findings said to be available with respect to the particular case studies. Uh, probably garbled that, but in effect the idea is that Parties having leave to appear should deal with the case studies in writing, limited to 20 pages, by 5 p.m. Friday, 31 August. So they will have uh, the full week after uh, council assisting have published their submissions. Now, I, the Commission has already announced uh, that uh, written submissions uh, will be invited both from parties having leave to appear and from the public more generally in relation to the policy issues that are identified in this round of hearings. And the proposal is that parties with leave and members of the public may make written submissions in relation to those policy issues that they have until 5 p.m. Friday, 21 September 18, to make those submissions. I have given some thought to what page limit I should impose on the policy submissions. My wish is that the submissions be uh, uh, as concise as the subject matter will permit, but the issues uh, are issues that do not admit of uh, being dealt with in half a page, I suspect. Uh, so I propose that the page limit should be 50 pages. But as with all page limits, that's the outer limit, not the necessary extent. And the proposal is that all of those submissions about policy should be lodged with the Commission through the Commission's website. The website will be set up in a way 
that will permit the public to make their written submissions, but so too parties should make their written submissions through the website so that we are getting all the policy papers uh, in through the one portal uh, and we're not uh, uh, ending up having to double handle everything. So to back up, written closing submissions by council assisting 5 p.m. Friday 24 August, parties with leave to appear Written submissions about the case studies, not exceeding uh, 30, uh, 20 pages, um, 5 p.m. Friday 31 August. Written submissions about policy issues, not exceeding 50 pages, 5 p.m. Friday 21 September. The last set of submissions all to be uh, channeled through the uh, uh, Commission website. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, Mr. Hodge. Commissioner, I have a list of additional tender documents, which is runs to 41 documents. Which you are not going to require me to read out, but you are going to make available to the transcript writer, or you're going to read out, Mr. Hodge, which? I certainly didn't propose to read it out myself, <laughs> Commissioner. I'd be quite happy to hand it to the transcript operator. I should indicate it is primarily witness statements in relation to either case studies that we haven't heard evidence in relation to or some, in some cases, additional witness statements for case studies that you have heard evidence in relation to. There are also some additional documents that have been referred to in the course of the hearings or which parties given leave to appear have asked us to tender and we'll publish the list on the website yes. as well. So if you're content with that, Commissioner, yes. I've told you that, otherwise I won't take that any further. What I proposed, Commissioner, was consistent with what we promised at about 10 a.m. two weeks ago that I would very briefly outline at the conclusion of these two rounds of hearing, some of the questions that we consider may arise and some other procedural matters. So long as you're content with yes. me doing that, Commissioner, I'll proceed to do that. Perhaps if I start with these observations, over the course of the past two weeks, you've heard evidence, Commissioner, by our count from seven directors of trustees, including four chairs and one deputy chair, two CEOs and nine other officers from within trustees or their service providers. And cumulatively, the trustees that have been covered in oral evidence are responsible for more than $627 billion worth of funds under management, which is more than 38% of the total funds held in regulated super funds in Australia as at 30 June 2017. And those trustees are also responsible for $228 billion of my super assets. In the documents that have been tendered, there are some statements related to two case studies that we had initially proposed to deal with and have now elected not to deal with orally. And I should just indicate what those are. In addition to CBUS, which we spoke about on the opening, the other two entities are Sun Super and MRSA. In relation to Sun Super, investigations continued in relation to it last week, and we concluded that the issue that was raised there was of insufficient general application to warrant consideration orally. And in relation to MRSA, the issue ultimately we determined didn't go beyond something that had already been addressed publicly in a news report. And shortly before the commencement of the hearings, we received a submission from MRSA acknowledging that the conduct or some aspects of the conduct may fall below community standards and expectations. What the evidence as a whole suggests is that it may well be the case 
that you will conclude that some RSE licensees are not, as they are obliged to do, prioritising the interests of their members over the interests of others, including themselves and the groups of which they are parties. And there are certain types of decisions that seem to particularly raise matters of concern. The decision to charge or allow others to charge members fees which are then paid to financial advisors in circumstances where the member doesn't receive or could not have been receiving the services in respect of which the service was provided. And in some cases, that would also be not the, ser the financial advisor, him or herself, but rather some other company within the group that was supposed to be <coughs> providing services. Another decision of concern are decisions to charge or maintain grandfathered trailing commissions and other forms of conflicted remuneration. Another decision of concern is the decision to delay, or at the very least not expedite, the transition of accrued default amounts to a My Super product with, it would seem, one apparent effect being to entrench members for a longer period of time in legacy products with trailing commissions. A fourth decision is the potential failure to become aware and intervene to prevent the charging of fees by a related party where those fees result in negative returns to members. And a fifth type of decision is the potential failure to exercise proper oversight over the distribution channels of a trustee's superannuation products by related parties. And those decisions, as we say, may be ones which do not demonstrate a sufficient prioritisation or any prioritisation of the interests of the members over the interests of the trustee or parties related to the trustee. They may, it may also be conduct which is in contravention of the best interest duty and other legal obligations. There was also evidence, Commissioner, that you may ultimately conclude suggests that some trustees may have failed to exercise their discretions independently of other influences or third parties. And it would seem to follow from the fiduciary obligations of the trustees that this ought not have occurred. One particular example is the outsourcing of services which are required to administer a trust. That is not something that is prohibited. But outsourcing does not absolve the trustee of ultimate responsibility for what occurs in relation to the use and application of trust money. A third issue that you may consider, Commissioner, is that there was evidence that suggests that there may have been problems with the ways in which some trustees communicated to members information that was provided to members that had the potential to confuse or to mislead them. And some examples of things that we looked at over the course of the week included disclosure about service fees, disclosure about tax surpluses, statements about the reasons, consequences or effects of the transition from accrued default amounts to my super, statements about the reasons why compensation was now being paid, or information provided to members about commissions and other forms of conflicted remuneration. These things that we have observed, Commissioner, go to this. Members of superannuation funds, like most beneficiaries, are vulnerable. And in respect of superannuation, many are disengaged and disadvantaged by a lack of financial literacy they are readily able to be taken advantage of. And the evidence you may conclude, Commissioner, suggests that this has occurred in some cases. In most industries, the forces of competition can be relied upon to minimise improper conduct and effective regulation can be expected to address breaches of the law when breaches occur. However, 
for superannuation, the disengagement of members, amongst other things, may limit the effectiveness of competition. And there are also questions, Commissioner, as is apparent, about the effectiveness of regulation in relation to superannuation. Those things combined mean, as we said in the opening, that there is a particular importance for members of the RSE licensees complying with their fiduciary obligations. Now, against these overarching issues, there are some specific questions that we will identify now to assist the parties in preparing for their general written submissions. And further questions will be expanded upon in the written closing next week. The first question is this. Are there structures that raise inherent problems for a superannuation trustee being able to comply with its fiduciary duties? For example, where a trustee is a DRE, that would seem to raise an inherent conflict of interest or the potential of a conflict of interest. But are there other structures, such as investment of funds in insurance policies issued by related party insurers, or the integration of a superannuation trustee into an advice business that also raise inherent problems. Second, if these structures do raise inherent problems, is structural change of entities mandated by legislation or otherwise something that is desirable? There are obvious and very significant challenges with mandating structures or structural changes. And an important question is, can it really be said with any confidence that conflicts that arise from structures are so unmanageable as to warrant legislative intervention, where one would think that ordinarily the very strong preference should be away from any form of legislative intervention in particular corporate structures? Third, apart from structural arrangements, are there other types of relationships that present obvious challenges to a trustee in discharging its duties, or where the benefits to the member of those relationships are limited or non-existent? If so, would it be appropriate to make legislative interventions to eliminate those temptations and difficulties for trustees? For example, would it be desirable to prohibit all commissions payable from superannuation products and end grandfathering, at least in relation to superannuation products? Might it also be desirable to prohibit ongoing advice fees being deducted by trustees from superannuation accounts? To do so would mean that financial advisors could only be paid from a member's superannuation account for one-off advice to a member in relation to superannuation. A consumer could still enter into an arrangement to make ongoing payments from the consumer's bank account to a financial advisor if the consumer wished to pay for and commit to paying for ongoing advice. A consumer would likely be aware of ongoing direct debits from the consumer's bank account or a consumer would have to authorise a specific payment for one-off advice where the payment is coming from the consumer's superannuation account. Such a payment could, in accordance with the sole purpose test, only be in respect of advice relating to superannuation. In this way, the risk of a consumer's superannuation balance being depleted by ongoing advice fees dripping out of the account would be removed. Such a change might act to nudge a consumer to consider more carefully what financial advice she or he wishes to obtain and what she or he wishes to, pay, wishes to pay for it. It would also remove the risk of a trustee making deductions from a superannuation account to make ongoing payments to a financial advisor or to some other entity for services that were not provided or not provided adequately. 
It would thereby protect both the member and the trustee. But would it have a detrimental effect on the provision of financial advice to consumers so as to harm their financial interests? Fourth, is it necessary to strengthen existing laws prohibiting misconduct so as to address misconduct identified during the course of the hearings or potential misconduct identified during the course of the hearings? Or is it simply necessary to enforce existing laws? Perhaps there are small changes that are required. For example, should there be harsher penalties for directors who breach their covenants imposed under the CIS Act? Should there be civil penalties for failing to act in the best interests of members? Should there be greater civil penalties for breaches of the sole purpose test? Fifth, what can be done to encourage the regulators to act promptly on misconduct or potential misconduct? And is the present allocation of regulatory roles appropriate to achieve specific and general deterrence for misconduct? Given that what we are fundamentally concerned with is conduct that in subtle but ongoing ways negatively affects the retirement outcomes of consumers, are either of the regulators best placed to carry the responsibility to protect consumers, should the balance between them be restructured or significantly altered? Sixth and finally, are there further structural tweaks necessary to make it more likely that consumer interests will be best served in the superannuation industry? And Commissioner, we offer two examples that might assist to remove or mitigate temptations for trustees. The first is stapling, meaning consumers are attached to a single superannuation account and do not end up with new accounts each time they change jobs, which might reduce the incentive for superannuation trustees to wish to maintain low balance members. Second, would it be desirable to impose obligations on the shareholders of trustees to exercise powers under their constitution or when otherwise acting in relation to the trustee to do so in the best interests of the members? Commissioner, those are all the things that we wish to say now. The various questions and issues which we have raised will be refined and developed further in our written submissions. And subject to anything further you may wish to say, Commissioner, that concludes the oral round of hearings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Hodge. Uh, the Commission will adjourn until 10th September uh, next at 9.45.